a man sets out, on foot, to embark on a journey of discovery. Will he find what his heart desires? Or, given that this is a world much different from the one that we occupy, will he find great disappointment in where he goes? Such are the questions asked in tonight's story. Another fantastic one from Dr. Creepens Vault, the subreddit that I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all for you. And a real thrilling story I have for you this evening. In diary form, we follow the journey of George as he embarks on a journey of hope. Well, my dear friends, it's once again time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. Day one. Today was the day. I set off in the early morning. Dave, Viola, and old Carl saw me off, as well as most of the children. The kids were surprised that I was leaving. I don't know how they didn't feel the atmosphere of departure. I was almost eager to leave for at least a week now. But still, it hurt to leave. I don't know if I'm ever going to see anybody from the camp ever again. Especially if the reports from St. Colin were true. As uneasy and, quite frankly... Afraid I might have felt, the view was gorgeous. The sun rising out of the sea in the east, reflecting in the Nera, Helene's skyline in the south. No matter how this journey ends, nostalgia will probably make this place the most beautiful one in the whole world. I reached the bottom of the mountain somewhere around early noon. I turned north and, after another hour or two of hiking, I found the highway. Well, if the 21 counts as a highway, that is. It does, right? Well, it did, if anything. I followed it for the rest of the day and found a somewhat covered ditch near the roadbed in the early dusk. Although certainly not the most comfortable place to rest, it seemed to be at least somewhat protected from wind and rain. Good enough for me. Day 2 The night was quiet. The day too, thinking back. I am aware that the camp, by design, is rather loud, but this absolute silence. I wasn't that big of an outdoorsman before, so I wouldn't know, but it just seems odd. Too quiet, if I'm allowed this cliché. Well, I continued to trek along the 21 for most of the day, and I must say, it was boring. Turns out travelling on highways is always a drag regardless if a car is involved or not. But I made use of the free time and practiced navigating. Well, estimating my current position, to be more exact. If, that's a big if, my navigation attempts were correct, I should hit the intersection with the 22 and 24 the day after tomorrow. The weather was deteriorating over the course of the afternoon, but luckily I found a wreck that wasn't completely wrecked. God. How many years has it been since I sat in a driver's seat? Day 3 The night in the car wreck was actually quite comfortable. As rusty and mouldy as it may have been, it was soft. More importantly, it kept the rain away. I don't know when it started pouring or when it ended, but this morning everything was soaked. I'm glad I'm supposed to stay on the road anyway. Everything not asphalt was literally a swamp for most of the day. But that has its good size too, since I spotted and shot a partridge in the late morning. Retrieving it out of the mud was a bit of a problem, but I managed. I think it will top off my food supplies for at least two days. It seems my navigation attempts from yesterday were not completely wrong. When the sun began to sink, I could make out the 22 branching off in the distance. Sadly... I didn't get so lucky with my campsite today. No cars, no trees, not even a good ditch to sleep in. The road bed will have to do, but my back will hurt tomorrow. Not looking forward to that. Day 4 I broke off camp in the morning when my radio actually received something. Turns out, it was a message from the camp. They were letting me know that they'd fixed the well and that it was clean enough to drink out of again. Lots of well wishes. It was great, hearing that your loved ones are doing good. 
thinking back on it. I'm surprised I could even pick up the signal that far north. I didn't expect the transmitter at camp to work at all, and definitely not to send through the mountains. Anyway, pleasant surprises are always welcome. I crossed the 22 around noon, and by evening I could see the sea on the horizon again. And Mond End, of course. I'm currently debating with myself if I should search through the outskirts of the city. I'm sure I'll find something, but it would cost me a day at least. Well, that's a decision I'll have to make tomorrow morning. Future George, you're welcome. Day 5 I decided to plunder Mond End suburbs. I turned southeast as soon as I set out and reached the first houses at maybe ten. I found quite a lot of useful things. More batteries, several bottles of water, twenty rounds for my rifle, several cans of food, a first aid kit that didn't look too bad, and two cartridges for my camping burner. A good haul, all in all. Plus, resupplying my water reserves would have become a pressing matter in a day or two anyway. See, I'm thinking ahead here. The best thing that did come out of this little detour, I get to sleep in a proper bed tonight. Granted, it is moth-ridden and a bit rotten, but whatever. At least it isn't mouldy or have any bugs in it. Days five and six. I think they're gone now. I woke up in the middle of the night and heard footsteps, but not human ones. Well, not quite. It sounded like whatever it was was wearing shoes or boots, but it didn't sound human. I can't put my finger on what makes me so sure about that. Maybe the rhythm? I can't really say. As soon as I awoke and realized why it wasn't morning already, I silently grabbed my rifle, crawled into a corner and waited, completely silent. My nightly guest was slowly walking through the ground floor of the house, Maybe searching for something. Yes, guests, as in plural. I'm sure there were at least two, but maybe even three or four. I don't know what they were searching for. Probably just searching for loot like I was earlier in the day. I guess they found what they were looking for, since they left rather abruptly. I tried to see what they were through the nearest window, but in trying to stay silent, it was too slow to get a good look at them. Day 6 I have no idea what visited me last night. I lay awake until morning, not hearing anything suspicious. I also didn't see anything when I moved out. I kept looking back over my shoulder every few minutes, but never actually saw anything. I was on the highway again soon enough, which eased my nervousness of the last hours. But the glances back continued until the late afternoon. Nothing of note happened today as well, but I can make out the edge of Lake Daring and the woods surrounding it from my sleeping spot. That's only because my sleeping spot tonight happens to be a tower. I actually don't know what kind of tower it is. It's just a room on stilts, three stories up in the middle of nowhere. I'm looking forward to entering the forest in the following days. They won't slow me down as long as I stay on the road and the endless marches around me are getting boring these days. The weather's getting bad again, so it'll probably rain tonight. Day 7 I made good headway today, since this part of the 25 is mostly downhill. Granted, it's only by maybe 5 degrees or so, but apparently it's enough for a smart in neutral to roll down. I noticed the car because it seemed nearly undamaged by all this time out in the open. Of course, it didn't have any gas in it, but I figured I'd try to soapbox it, and lo and behold, it worked. I think I made at least two days' worth of distance today. I even got to do a bit of hunting and gathering when my new car ran out of momentum, so my supplies are stocked up once again. It's been a week now since I last saw anybody. I hope the guys back at camp are okay, or... At least, alive. Funny how time flows when you're alone for a long time. If anybody would ask me right now how long I'd been away, well, I'd probably be startled as hell and punched them. But I'd probably guess the time way too high. 
strange actually since things that actually form memories only happen maybe 10 times a day so judging by that you're away for what two three days whatever it has been a week period day eight I arrived at the highway bridge over the cell today it was completely wrecked only the bridgeheads remained no way this is going to be repaired. Ever. And crossing the cell without a boat any time other than deep winter? No, thank you. So, I guess I have to head west. And if all the bridges in Polk are destroyed too, go around the law, I guess? Or hike over it. I'll cross that bridge when I get there. Or not cross it, probably. I'll have to go through the forest for the next few days. I'm not worried about losing my way. I'm pretty confident in my navigation skills by now. But going through the woods is both going to slow me down and make me more prone towards ambushes. I guess I could fight off two, maybe three chasers if I hear them coming. But a thrasher? No chance. I doubt I even have enough bullets for that if it stands still. Day 9. I made about two-thirds of the distance I could on the road. So, well, I guess I'm doing good, plus I'm stumbling on brooklets every few hours. Most of them clean enough to drink, so water's not going to be a problem in the foreseeable future. In the early evening, I even shot a small deer. That's going to feed me for at least half a week, probably more. But skinning and roasting it will take a good part of tomorrow, and the extra weight is going to slow me down even further. Day 10. I found the radio station. The one that used to send K-11. It was in working order, too. How it survived, let alone remain charged until now, I'll never know. But it does, and that's great. I managed to send a broadcast, and I'm pretty sure the camp can pick it up. I mean, this station could send to the furthest edges of the Kazan Mountains, so down to Halein, at the most, will be easy. I don't know when the others will head out, but I don't think they have yet. Or, if they have, they couldn't have come far, so I warned them about the destroyed bridge. I also told them where to find the station, if they needed to answer me. Actually, I'm just going to write down my transmission. Who's going to stop me? Hey guys, it's me, George. I'm at the old K-11 station right now. Do not take the 24 and 25. The sow bridge is down. Go over Trakes instead. If you need to reach me, the station is... Oh, if you draw a line straight through Daring, another through the last part of Cell, I'm where they'd hit. I'll continue to scout ahead. Meet me at the westmost highway entry of Cayman. I'll be waiting there. Good luck to you all. I really hope Trakes is safe. There could be God knows what lurking around there. But the whole group wouldn't make the trip through the forest. I'll just have to hope and pray. Day 11. I arrived at the outskirts of Polk today. Saw a lot of birds and even a hare or two, so at least I know there are no thrashes around. That's at least something. I'm not really familiar with the geography of Polk. I was here only once before, and that was in my college years. It must have been 15 years now. But I remember there are seven bridges over the cell. Maybe they even built more in the time being. At least one of them has to be intact. I'm making camp in an apartment building in the outskirts tonight. Tomorrow, I'll follow the 31 through the city. If I'm lucky, the highway bridge still stands. Day 12. The highway bridge does not stand anymore. In fact, all the bridges in the eastern half of Polk are destroyed. I'm camping in an office building, and I can see one a bit to the west that seems, well, not undamaged, but possible. I'll try to cross tomorrow. I saw humans today, too. When I was walking down the waterfronts, I saw them two blocks ahead. At first, I wanted to make contact, but they carried an awful lot of weapons. Too many for simple self-protection. 
and there are too many animals around them to be hunting a thrasher. And so I chose to remain hidden. Unfortunately, I had to wait most of the day for them to leave. I didn't want to risk an encounter with possible raiders. Living slow is bad nowadays, but not living at all is worse. Day 13. I crossed the cell today. The bridge I'd spotted yesterday evening was passable. Even more than just passable. It may have looked pretty banged up at first, but I think it'll stand at least a decade if no storms or earthquakes hit. So I made good distance on the road. I think I'll reach Cayman the day after tomorrow. And I'm sure I'll find somebody there. I mean, it's Cayman, for crying out loud. If there are any people anywhere, they're there. I just hope they'll take us in. Day 40. I'm an hour or two away from the outskirts of Cayman. I can already see the big three from here. I wish I could have visited them once. Go up on the roof, I mean. The view must have been incredible. I don't see any signs of human habitation in the area I can see. But that doesn't have to mean anything. I can see maybe 5% of the city. And that's a high guess. I don't think I'll be having any trouble with my spies. And even if the others back at camp left as soon as I sent them the instructions to go west instead of east... Well, they won't arrive for at least four more days, even with them taking the significantly shorter route. So, I think I have some time to find somebody. Day 15. I entered Cayman today in search for, well, someone. I didn't find anybody, but I found makeshift barricades at the ground floors of a few houses, some of them looking no older than a week. I'm confident that I'll find the residents or at least their traces if they've left. The bad news is, I heard a chaser howl in the afternoon. It didn't sound like it was near me. I'd guess at least three blocks away. But still, one chaser means most likely a handful of chasers, and that means trouble. The barricades don't seem compromised, but maybe the residents left because of the threat of a breach. Anyway, I looted a gun store an hour ago. Surprisingly, it wasn't cleared out. Yeah, some stuff was taken, but not everything. My guess is that a few people came by to stock up on ammo and take their favorite weapons, but a lot was left behind. That'll help me and the others a big deal. I've already stocked up on ammo for my rifle and pocketed a nice-looking revolver and some rounds for it, too. If I find a trolley or something, I'll take a nice stash with me when I head out to wait for the others. Day 16. I continued to search the city. I didn't find anybody, but I think I may have heard a conversation. I'm not sure, and I didn't see anything, but I'll not give up on finding someone. Supply-wise, the situation is mixed. I think I can keep going for at least a week with what I have on me right now. But finding clean water in the city is going to be difficult. Food, on the other hand, is pretty much everywhere. I didn't even really try, and I found enough to last me until the year's end just today. And here I was, worrying that the caravan would starve if we had to continue further north than Cayman. I found graffiti on a wall in Salon Square. I can't tell how old it is, but it is pretty clean, so maybe a week? Two? It states that the subway is occupied with a big pack of chasers. Oh, I'm not sure if this information is accurate anymore. But I sure as hell won't go checking. Day 17. I found people today. They're a married couple named Gloria and Marvin. I stumbled upon them in a mall. They were searching for water, and so was I. They were really friendly, and still are. They, apparently, are part of a larger group of around 500 people that used to live in Southern Cayman. But when they heard from St. Colin, they too decided to move. But, in contrast to us, they were ready to go on pretty much a moment's notice. They sent out scouts north and west to search for a new suitable home base, and apparently they found a pretty promising location. They decided to move to Blester, a small mining town to the west. 
It's way into the Boral Woods, way back at the foot of the Kazan Mountains. This place is so out of the way that they're confident they'll be relatively safe there. Plus, if push comes to shove, they'll be able to flee into the mountains, maybe even enter Urien. I doubt they'll have trouble at the border. The only reason that Gloria and Marvin remained is to intercept and redirect returning scouts. Leave no man behind, I guess. It's good to know camaraderie and reliable friends have survived until now. They invited me to join them, and when I explained that I'm kind of a scout myself, they extended the invitation to the whole camp. The more the merrier, they said, and Blester and the surrounding area would be easily capable of supporting the additional hundred or so people. The hard work is done. Now I just have to wait for my people to arrive. Marv even said they'd wait with me. Day 18 We continued searching for supplies, and even found two returning scouts. They came from the northeast, Timin to be exact. They came back pretty empty-handed, and crushed, but lightened up immediately when they learned of Blester, and even more, when they heard of the new faces they could expect. According to Gloria, they were the last scouts, but they insisted on waiting with me. But the scouts were sent ahead, mostly to inform their group of the good news. It took quite the convincing for them to go on ahead, but we managed to. Warning of an additional hundred mouths to feed was more important than being courteous. We saw them off from the 32, where I was supposed to meet my folks sometime soon anyway. We actually found a shopping cart during the day and managed to ferry a good amount of food and weapons to the rally point, so we could wait for a while and the additional weapons would only help in the long-term defense of Blaster. Day 90 The others arrived today. They came in in the early afternoon, pretty exhausted but otherwise okay. I was overjoyed to see them again, and Dave came up to greet me as soon as I gave away my presence. I introduced Gloria and Marv shortly to him, old Carl and a few others, as well as our plan to head for Blaster. They were, mostly, for it. Of course, some voiced their distrust, but we managed to calm them for now. I told them the story of my journey, and asked for theirs. At this point, I hadn't even realized that Viola, Emmett, and Alex were missing. The group followed my instructions into Trakes, but the group was assaulted by a pack of chasers halfway between Trakes and Polk. At least twenty of them. The three decided to arm themselves and distract the pack to give the main group time to get away. They said they would catch up as soon as they'd shaken off or killed the pack, but they all knew they likely wouldn't come back. And they didn't. <sighs> At least they didn't die to thrashers. Dave said he heard three shots, one directly after the other at the end, but I think he just wants to comfort me. It'd be nice to know they didn't have to suffer. I'll try to believe that they didn't. I'll be honest here. I didn't know Emmett or Alex, so I won't be missing them. But Viola, that hurts. Guess that's the price we have to pay to live another day. At least the kids are safe. Well, alive. I don't know where they would be truly safe. Hopefully, blessed her, but who knows. Day 20. We set off towards the west in the early morning, all of us. I expected the full caravan to be rather slow, but I think we made the same distance I would have done alone, or at least not that much less. Morale was pretty low after losing three people in the chaser raid, but meeting up with me again and getting invited to an already somewhat established settlement by Gloria and Marv boosted it beyond what it was at the start, or so I'm told at least. One could even say we're optimistic. We, as in the group, I for one am really despairing. I do believe we can reach Blessed and we'll prosper there. But what for? I hadn't even realized how much I liked Viola before she died. Maybe I'm just over-experiencing due to the loss, but I think I may have been in love with her. To be fair, I was never any good at making others realize I liked them, or even realize it myself, but still enough to make me doubt the point in all of this. 
Day 21. We're past the halfway point. Supplies are slowly running low, but it will last four to five days at least, so easily until Blaster. The group as a whole is getting exhausted, but their enthusiasm keeps the speed up. I don't know anything about the geography of the Bora Woods, but Marv says we may be able to see the outskirts of Blester by tomorrow evening. We cut the actual walking time a bit short today, both to go a bit easier on the old and weak ones, as well as to stock up a bit further. We make camp at a cave near the road and sent out multiple groups to get water, to gather edible plants and maybe even shoot some game. Dave and I got ourselves a stack, but I don't know how successful the other groups were. So I have no idea how long our provisions are going to last now. But I don't think I'll need to check that. It won't matter until we get to Blester, and once we're there, we'll combine our stash with that of Gloria and Marv's group. The forests here are pretty dense, and mostly pines, so I don't think we'll have too much trouble with thrashes in the future. The few that will actually find us won't be able to move that much. They will still be a serious threat, but much more easy to deal with especially if we can set up some robust tree houses and platforms to shoot from. I can't sleep. I have a feeling something bad's going to happen. Maybe a fire in the cave. We have three fire pits at the entry to prepare the food and process the stag and, and whatever else we may have caught. We'll make sure they're careful. The guys at the fires are pretty aware of the danger. No worries there on my side. I saw we got another deer, a female this time. A hare, a pheasant, and somebody managed to catch two fish. Salmon, I guess, but neither I nor any of the cooks know for sure. Whatever. I was never really a fish person anyway. Day 22. The caravan was slow today. One of the carts broke down. Nothing we couldn't fix, but it's taking us two hours already. Freddy's confident we'll be on the move within the hour, but until then I'll continue to not have to do anything. I wish I could help. At least, it would keep my mind off Viola. Shortly after the wagon was fixed, a pack of chasers turned up. We saw them coming, so we could prepare a bit. Dave, Freddy and I were the sacrifices this time. I have no problem giving my life for the group, but Dave try to get him out of this situation. The situation being us, stuck on a tree, with the pack under us. Freddy is, well, they got him. At least the caravan is safe. We pulled them a long way, I guess a bit more than two miles, two and a half maybe. We managed to thin out the pack a bit, but I still count at least 30 chasers. Between Dave and I, we have 41 bullets remaining. Meaning, if we make good shots, we could get back to the group. But I set aside two, just in case. Meaning, if we make good shots, we could get back to the group. But I set two aside, just in case. I haven't asked Dave yet, and I hope I don't have to, but I don't want to die in the fangs of an abomination. A bullet is cleaner and faster. So, 39 shots, 30 targets. Let's make them count. Godspeed, Dave. Godspeed. George Trier. So it's uh, a format that I quite enjoy reading, uh, the diary format, and it's always a bit of a challenge to uh, go through the different emotions from day to day and, you know, try to get the feelings, the thoughts and the emotions of the protagonist just right as each day passes and the events tend to like change from day to day. Did I do it right? <laughs> I hope so. Well, let me know in the comments section below the video. And if you didn't like it, well, another story will be along on Wednesday. The continuation of Black Week. We're on to Wednesday already. I hope you're enjoying that series because it's a real pleasure for me to read to you all. If you don't like it, there'll be another story on Friday as well. <laughs> the fun never stops, does it? Well, until then, my dear friends, sweet dreams and bye-bye.
Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>